I'm here with Jay Livingston from Montclair State University. Uh, Jay runs the Montclair Socio blog. It's at uh, Montclair Soci, so S O C I dot blogspot dot com. How long have you been blogging, Jay? Uh, since 2000, let's see, September 2006, so 12 and a half years. You've got to be one of the longest sociology blogs going. I think so. I mean, I. I I looked at all the others uh, that I noted and, and bookmarked along the way. Hmm. And a lot of those people, I mean, the good people, Gabriel and uh-huh. uh, Tina Fetner and Jeremy Fries and Chris Eugen and good people. And they stopped. I think Fabio is probably the most consistent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm not sure when he started uh, Org Theory. I, re- I remember seeing your, your blog in grad school, though, like... Uh... You know, so it's it's an institution in the, <laughs> I guess, in digital sociology. <laughs> but uh, we had a, a great exchange about a bit we did earlier on the annex about uh, Eric Kleinenberg, loneliness and living alone. And what I enjoyed about it is Jay's been in the business a long time. And I guess you've been there long enough so that what we think is fresh and new, you can see like the uh, old wine in new bottles. And I just love that aspect of it. So let's set up the... Let's set up the story and then we'll get into it. So Jay was blogging on that same conversation about loneliness, uh, which I guess was initially generated by a, a New York Times story by David Brooks or? No, Arthur Brooks. Arthur Brooks. Okay. Do you want to give a, a summary of it just to set the stage? Well, yeah, Arthur Brooks, who is, uh, the Times has two conservative uh, columnists, one who's on salary, David Brooks, and then the other who contributes once a month or so, Arthur Brooks from the American Enterprise Institute. And Arthur Brooks had a column, and I can't remember the exact title, but either the title or in it appeared uh, the phrase epidemic of loneliness. And he was uh, basing it on some uh, report from Cigna that came out saying that some, like over half of the country was lonely. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, uh, yeah, we've been here before, and <laughs> especially, uh, I was thinking, the guy who has really done the debunking of this long, because it crops up regularly, yeah. and the guy who is, goes to the data and looks and debunks it is Claude Fisher at Berkeley. Mm. Right. And, and so I read it and I thought, oh, wait till Claude sees this, if he hasn't already. And then I waited for him to uh, to write about it in his blog, which is called Made mm. in America. And he didn't, so I blogged something about it. And but to the idea that we keep getting these reports about an epidemic of loneliness, and that yeah. Americans are lonely or not. And it is true that people are lonely. Although after the Cigna report, another Pew came out with something like the figure was around ten percent. Mm. But um, but whatever it is, the chances are it hasn't increased all that much over right. the last several decades, at least, maybe longer ago than that. Mm. And so I started wondering, well, why is this myth so persistent? What is the appeal of this uh, of this myth? Mm-hmm. And um, and that reminded me of another myth that I blogged about like, within the first. I think six months that I was doing the uh, uh, the blog back in 2006 or seven, and that was the myth of the authoritarian past. Well, what's, which one's that? I don't remember that. Or... Well, there is, um, you know, you hear, you know, it's it's frequent to hear people complain about kids these days that they don't listen to their parents, and mm-hmm. you know, and. And several times since I've been writing the blog, I, I'm, I'm just reminded of that song from Bye Bye Birdie. Uh, you know, kids, uh, what the heck is wrong with these kids today? Kids, uh-huh. they are disobedient, disrespectful oafs and whiny and lazy. And, uh, uh-huh. and that song, that show began, uh, opened in 1960. So it's really a 1950s. <laughs> so if people were making that complaint about kids in the 50s, yeah. that, that somehow that that uh, for parents in the 50s, oh, that their parents were much more authoritarian and kids listened to their parents. Right. And then we've had this same thing. Like every generation, you hear this, you know, people complaining about, oh, well, I was a kid or, you know, well, yeah. 
you know, you look at some kid and say, well, gee, I could never get away with that with my old man. Right. And- oh, I remember, I remember the articles about how Generation X doesn't want to work. Oh, and, yeah. Uh- <laughs> yeah. Well, that has a lot more to do with labor market uh, forces. But anyway, yeah. I thought, well, what is, what is the appeal of this? Where does, where does the sense of the authoritarian past because obviously each generation couldn't be less and less authoritarian because we long ago would have hit the zero authoritarianness yeah. thing, right? We're, we're at the yeah. asymptote. Um, and yet, and so I remember this cartoon. It's a great cartoon. I wish I had a copy, and but it shows a father and son coming out of the house after a big snowstorm. Mm-hmm. And they're trudging through this high snow. And it, it's like a almost to the father's knees Mm -hmm. and trudging behind him is his little son. And on the son, you know, it's up to his chest and the father is holding his hand up, hand up to his chest, you know, parallel Mm -hmm. with the ground saying, Hey, this is nothing. When I was a kid, we had snow up to here. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And, and so I was thinking it's the same thing with, with authoritarianism that is to the kid the snow is up mm-hmm. to here. So to a child, right. adults look very authoritarian and powerful and, you know, to be feared and so on, because they are, they're much bigger than a six-year-old. Mm-hmm. And so you remember parents, when you were a kid, they were much more right. powerful. And, such. and then you grow up to be an adult mm-hmm. and you realize that as an adult, no, you're not really all that powerful that you have to, you know, make all kinds of compromises with the world mm-hmm. and you're, you know, negotiating with the world in a number of ways. And that even your kids seem to you to be not all that uh, commandable and so on. Right. So it's like and, a perspective thing. It's like, uh, it's a perspective thing, a coming well, of age type of Yeah, the, uh, the, the analogy I used was from a discredited idea in, in evolution uh, called mm-hmm. ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which is that the development of the fetus, mm-hmm. it goes through the same stages as the evolution of the species. Mm-hmm. So that the very <laughs> early stages of the feces, species look like a the very early stages of the species when it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was growing in utero. <laughs> so the same thing. So, uh, so the same thing with people. They they assume that the development of me from f- being fearful of authority mm-hmm. to me seeing adults with having no authority or little mm-hmm. authority somehow recapitulates what's going on in the wider society, which is that the degree of authoritarianism has decreased. Right. When in fact it stays the same. Then you're right. It's a matter of perspective from the kid's perspective looks like the world is authoritarian and from the when he grows up it looks like eh, not so authoritarian after all but assumes right. that it's because the world has changed not because he has changed right so this is so it's another example of how we sort of have these perennial ideas of social trends where people feel like they're at the apex of some massive change when in fact it's business as usual as it has always been yeah and so that even when there's no change for the society, there is change for the individual because the individual is no longer a kid of six or seven. He's now a grown up of 36. Right. And then they write about it and all the other people who are turning however old and coming of age at the same time share it on Facebook and thus a fad of thought. Right. right. <laughs> but but you see this every generation, no matter how far you go back. And so I was thinking, well, that the the author- the myth of the authoritarian past is one that's particularly appealing to people who like authoritarianism and wish that Mm. things today were more authoritarian. Um, And that leaves out us liberals. Mm. And so I was thinking maybe it's the same appeal with the myth of the communitarian past where Mm -hmm. nobody was lonely and life was more gemeinschaftlich. (laughs) And, and I thought, well, maybe it's the same mechanism because Mm. after all, when you're a kid, feelings matter a lot. You can be that you can be dependent on others. You have to be dependent on others, and others are reliably there to, uh, you know, to take care of your needs and your dependencies, mm-hmm. and that the world is warm and interpersonal and so on. And then when you grow up, 
mm-hmm. then personal relations, those kinds of personal relations are not as intense. And there's a lot more, you know, I call it gesellschaftlich kinds of relations that you are engaged in. Mm-hmm. And so you think, gee, you know, when I was a kid, people used to look out for one another and take care right, of right. one another. And all that. And what is the bowl in leagues and all that? Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, they used to bowl together. Uh, huh. And so and so I call it the myth of the communitarian past. That's, and so you have these two parallel myths. One mm-hmm. is the epidemic of loneliness and its uh, uh, its corollary is the decline of community. That's interesting. It reminds me of the narrative of consumerism is quite similar, I think. For example, I remember reading a passage in Adam Smith's uh, Moral Foundations where he talks about like uh, people who are lovers of toys and, uh, you know, want to spend their money on ear pickers and are no longer content with the cottage of their father. You know, that's the late 18th century. (laughs) Well, the same thing. I think somebody... Maybe Kieran or somebody dug up a quote from some ancient Roman complaining about, you know, kids don't listen to their parents anymore the way we used to. Um, <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, but, but in sociology, we have these books. Hmm. And, you know, in the blog, I, I juxtapose three uh, book covers. And one hmm. is The Lonely Crowd. Great book. Very hmm. important book from 1950. Uh, mm. And then 1970, Philip Slater, The Pursuit of Loneliness, also a very good book. Mm. Uh, and then uh, 30 years later, Bowling Alone, 2000, and all hitting on this mm. same thing that that we have a decline of community and, and an increase right. in isolation and loneliness. Uh, so I think it's what liberals want more of, just the same as conservatives want more authoritarianism, liberals want more mm. communitarianism. And so we mm. that goes hand in hand with being able to remember the old days as more communitarian. And everybody what, looked out for each yeah, other. Yeah, and what, what you're really doing is extrapolating from when I w- my life when I was a kid to the old days society has changed society hasn't changed it's just that you're now an adult and life for adults is not as communitarian as it is for children you know what i like about that whole take it made me reflect on sort of just the craft of doing sociology you know and you like to think that we're a social science that's developing cumulative knowledge and you know uh advancing sort of pulling humanity's knowledge of how society works in some linear fashion where we don't go back. But when I was looking at your comparisons, boy, when you look at it through that type of perspective, it looks like we're basically, it's just a, an eternal quest to quash the easy tropes that seem to just come up every 20 to 30 years. It's just like an, it's an easy, easy argument, sort of a nice intuitive argument that, someone's going to like, and then it becomes sort of stale until everybody forgets about it. And then someone else resurrects it. You know, like John Kenneth Galbraith said, financial crises happen every 20 years, which is about how long you need for like a new crop of young people who didn't experience the last one to start getting some money. Yes. Except you know? financial crises can actually be measured. Uh, the And you know, what Claude Fisher has tried to recreate is data which would show whether there actually is a loneliness crisis in a way that there Mm. are epidemic in a way that there hasn't been in the past and he you know you can't find it so Mm. um so what we're reproducing is the same story but and and it may be a good story it may be in some ways a true story but it's not a new story you know and so to write about it as though it is new is to forget, you know, that the story has been written before. So, Jay, you've been in the business for for a while, right? right? I don't want to, uh, <laughs> but like, so I, like, you've been in the business for a while, and uh, so what? Like, is this is this how it's always been? It's basically, you know, people looking, we're slinging stories, and it's not so much of a cumulative enterprise. Like, is this just something that you see after being in the business for you know a few decades? You're like, ah, oh, he's doing, uh, he's resurrecting so and so, or he's doing this shtick, or oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, some ideas are just too appealing to let 
you know, to let go of. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and because maybe there's something to them, you know, I think I wrote to you, the first time I wrote to you was about, I think you and Leslie and maybe Gabriel was in on too, were bantering about mm. uh, medical sociology and ethnic, dif right. eth ethnic differences in experiencing pain. And, uh -huh. and yeah, yeah. I remember when I was, I guess, an undergraduate, we were exposed to this article by a guy named Borowski writing exactly about that, mm. that, you know, you go to the hospital and you can tell who are the Jews and who are the wasps and who are the Italians <laughs> by the way they talk yeah. about the pain. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, it's probably, uh, you know, not as rigorous as uh, research as we would do today. But, you know, it's an appealing idea that then became sort of a little fell, I guess, out of favor, both in terms of ideology and maybe in terms of data. Mm. But you can see why it would keep coming back. It's funny, though. So it, it, it but it, it makes it it makes you feel as a sociologist like you're sort of on a hamster wheel. You know, like how there was, uh, you remember the Saturday morning cartoons where like they'd always defeat the bad guy, but you knew he'd be back next week and there was never any final solution to, you know, the eternal conflict. So these types of, you know, these types of recurrent tropes, I guess, is it just forever our duty to to probe them every time they come up every 20 years to redispel them? Or? Well, I think... I mean, it's interesting to look at the role of authoritarianism in, a in American life and especially American families. And mm -hmm. and it's true. I mean, because, you know, go back to the Tocqueville probably earlier, certainly later, you know, through the 19th century and visitors to America comment about how, well, they put it differently, you know, some think of it as the children's independence or liberty uh, or rudeness and ill matteredness, you know, depending on the visitor's point of view. But it's they're observing the same thing that American children are much more independent than European children. Uh, in the same way, loneliness is important, and if uh, and whether or not it's increasing, it it is an aspect of our culture, and and the concern with community is an aspect of our culture, even if it's not you know, periodically reaching epidemic levels, it's still something that's, mm. you know, community is one of the basic sociological concepts that it's interesting to see how and where it is and what's going along with it. That was Jay Livingston of Montclair State University. Jay has one of the longest running blogs in the discipline, Montclair Socio Blog. You can find it at Montclair Soci, that's S O C I. Dot blogspot.com. Thank you for uh, sitting down, Jay. Okay. Thanks a lot, John.